Welcome to SOS VHS. We're talking today to one of my favorite people, great comedian, stand-up actor and basketball player. Uh, welcome Rick Glassman. And we're talking about his favorite movie, Terminator 2. Should we start? I don't need to. <laughs> okay. So in 1991, when this movie comes out, uh, you are- We are going to start. Yeah. Okay. We are. All right. In 91. When the movie comes out, yeah. you are seven. Uh, I heard that you didn't have, uh, I mean, you, you thought you had friends back then, but they didn't reciprocate. So did you go to see the movie alone? Um, it's burned me. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> at seven, I don't, at seven, nobody had friends, right? <laughs> seven, you're just, you know, you're at home with your parents. So that wasn't an issue then. I uh, I remember seeing it in the theaters, although I was told I didn't see it in the theaters, so I don't know how that worked. Okay. But I was too young to remember. So, next question. So, what <laughs> what, what did it make an impact? Uh, Schwarzenegger. Make- Arnold Schwarzenegger made an impact on me. Um, I was obsessed with Arnold. Specifically, not necessarily in order, T2 was probably first. But uh, Kindergarten Cop, the Conan um, movies, and uh, True Lies. I was yeah. obsessed with him. I thought muscles were very cool. Okay. I had posters of him all over my wall. Schwarzenegger, Stallone, Van Damme. But Schwarzenegger all over my wall. Pictures of T2 all over my wall. Um, what about him? I thought he was cool. I thought he was cool. Like I wasn't into superheroes as a kid, necessarily in the classical sense, but he was my superhero. He was... That's actually not true. I love Superman. But like he was... Uh, I just saw his muscles and I just thought like that was, I just thought he was the coolest. I thought he was the coolest. I remember I saw an episode of uh, uh, Jaywalking with Jay Leno where he would go on the street and ask people stuff. And Mm -hmm. they said, if you could spell Schwarzenegger, I'll buy you a house and nobody could spell it. I could spell it. You could spell it. Yeah. At eight. S-C-H-W-A-R-Z-E-N-E-G-G-E-R. Could I say that? Yeah. You have a superpower. Yeah. You could could say that. Yeah. Um. But Terminator... uh, was uh you know he had the jacket and the glasses and he was just like he was just cool okay cooler than robocop i didn't think robocop no i i I honestly mean no disrespect to robocop (laughs) he's not cool i mean cool like the way cool used to be leather jacket the sunglasses okay to this day when i meet a a, uh uh a girl and i'm interested in her yeah i say i need your clothes, your boots, and your keys. <laughs> and and that, does it work? Oh, you tell me. <laughs> Thank you. No. I was going to show you without the clothes. No, I'm saying it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, that's, you know, everybody stop cramping my style, all right? Okay, yeah. I knew you were going to do it, so I, I um, too. Yeah, I, I just... I still am. I still I still think Arnold's... Have you ever seen Pumping Iron? Yeah. He's the coolest. He's so cool. That's like when people think what's cool. Like I guess it's a th- thing you grew up with. Maybe like the varsity quarterback is cool or whatever the cool thing is. No. Muscles now to me are in great. I see somebody with muscles, they're cool. Muscles are cool. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I love the robots and the sci-fi that's aspect of it. So you think RoboCop is cool? I thought RoboCop was pretty cool. But I liked it too more. Yeah. There's something about it. What'd you think of RoboCop's muscles? Uh Uh-huh. Hey. Oh, I I guess we got him right here. (laughs) Right. Jesus. (laughs) Um, Okay. So what what is your life like at seven? Up until I was 24, I remember probably 30 things. Okay. Um, All of which involve (laughs) me being seven and Terminator 2. So we're in luck. Okay. Seven. uh, What is that? Uh, That's that's third grade, right? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Second, third grade. That's when I was first diagnosed with ADD and then ADHD and then ADD again. I was on Ritalin. Mm-hmm. Got off that because uh, that's not cool. <laughs> and I was never hungry. I didn't want to eat. So I only took Ritalin for a little bit. It was two years before I had glasses. Okay. So I'm walking around doing this. Did you have muscles? No. Didn't you want muscles? You- yeah. Say, what are they say, cool? Say that again. Muscles. <laughs> yeah, say exactly what I said. Ask me that again. <laughs> didn't, didn't, you that want, didn't you want muscles? Of course, I still want muscles. Okay. No, you're pretty pretty good shape. I saw you. I saw you on, 
on your show on on um phenomenal and i, I saw you're pretty good thanks didn't look like arnold <laughs> no not like arnold um okay so so seven i'm in third grade yeah uh i have a huge crush can we bleep this or should i just not say your name you, we can bleep it i'll just do this okay blur my mouth too okay huge crush mm -hmm. she was going out with my boy at the time not my boy but you know someone's boy <laughs> and uh no she was going out with <laughs> was going out with <laughs> i remember even in third grade i remember thinking like what are you guys doing what are you doing? Mm -hmm. They would go, the moms would pick them up and they'd go to each other's houses. They'd go on double dates and walking and stuff. They held hands. I don't know if they were blowing each other or not. It's very young. But I, even then I remember like, <laughs> man, people, people just start early. Uh, and I got a little intimidated because I not only did I have a crush on her, she was holding hands with fucking <sighs> <laughs> When did you have Look your... at me now. <laughs> when do you have your first girlfriend? Um, or the first... Sarah, uh, uh, senior year of high school, um, I had my first kiss in uh, April of uh, 2002. I remember it like it was, you know, 21 years ago. Right. It feels like 19. <laughs> COVID. And, uh, you know, it took some time away. But, um, yeah, I remember even then, like, oh, people are kissing and holding hands. And, like, this idea of cool always stuck with me. Like, oh, there's something that's cool. That's something that's cool. That's something that's cool. And I never felt cool. I was never insecure that it wasn't cool. It was always something I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. But like there were or moments where there I realized, ooh, that's what cool is. That's what cool is. And things became intimidating if if I couldn't be it. So like not not going out with girls and not kissing girls, like, oh, I'm not cool, which makes me a loser. So like I still have this thing in me. I talk about this on stage, so I don't want to talk about it too much, but I still have this thing in me that's like if you don't kiss the if you know, if you you gotta kiss the girl or you're a loser. Mm-hmm. So I just feel sometimes I feel like I'm a skinny loser. <laughs> is that a motivator today? Like, is that like, don't, no. don't want to be a loser? No. Okay. It doesn't drive me. It just, it just makes like, it makes it easier to accept that like, maybe I'll never be Mr. Universe. Yeah, you probably know? not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but were, were you uh, like a little bit like John Connor? Did, did you get in, in trouble at all as a kid or were you a good kid? You know, it's interesting that you think getting in trouble means you're not a good kid. Okay. Okay. Were you a good I kid that you got in trouble? Have you ever gotten in trouble? I, yeah. Are you a good guy? Yeah. But I mostly, I, I didn't get that much in trouble. Why is that? Were you trying to be <laughs> good? Or are you just... Oh. I was just good. Yeah. Where'd you grow up? I grew up in, in Spain. Yeah. Spain, the Spanish people, they're, they're just, good. I mean, they're just, you know, they're fighting bulls. It's a right. different, it's a different thing in America. <laughs> yeah. Okay. If you throw a book at a teacher, you're going to get in trouble. <laughs> and yeah, I did that, but I didn't mean to throw it at him. I was throwing <laughs> books in the air while walking. And at the time I wasn't the most athletic and it just went further in front and it hit him on the head and it got me in trouble. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When, uh, <clears throat> I had to go to a special school in ninth grade for for bad kids. Okay. Yeah. Or as George Thorogood would say, zoom in, <laughs> bad to the bone kids. But uh, so yeah, I got in some trouble, but it was mostly behavioral issues and like hyper stuff as opposed to like, you know, or, you know, burn cigars on your pecs or something. Yeah. You weren't shoplifting and... I, I stole two times ever. Um The first time it was uh, some kids were stealing gum from a market <laughs> and, uh, you know, I took some gum and the next time I stole from camp, I stole somebody. Have you ever seen those things where you have glass jars and you can put sand in it and you do sand art? Yeah. I was getting picked up from day camp and I saw that somebody's and I took it and I got picked up by my mom and my grandma and I showed them what I made and they thought they're like, this is amazing. Like you did such a good job and I felt so bad and I told them I didn't. I didn't make this. And they said, well, what could you learn from this? I said, I won't, I won't do that again. I won't take it. And I never stole again. Oh, wow. Dun, 
That's really good. Cold open. All right. Yeah, I knew you were going to do it. <laughs> Can you put lyrics to that? I have. You have? Why do you cry? What does it mean to you? I'll understand before I die. But I can't terminate myself. So push the button while I do 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 and I'll do the thing where Yeah. Are you are you always on or do you need re recharging like the Terminator? We rephrase the question. What do you mean? Why what are you asking me right now? If you are always on. Okay, so that that I'm I'm going to take that as disrespect. Oh, and let okay. me tell you why. Why? Because I don't know if you're doing this on purpose, but you're calling me out uh, for being on. Are you always on? You're calling me out. I'm on a podcast here. Uh huh. I'm going to be on. I got a coffee for it. Uh, when I'm at home, am I doing the same thing? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Of course. <laughs> That's what I thought. When I'm a performer. <laughs> when the cameras are off, you're still you're still you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. You have an amazing energy. Don't don't get me wrong. I love it. You have an amazing energy. Is like, is like, if a somebody asks if why you're not interested in that girl, and you're like, well, I mean, she's got a great personality. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. No. What I, do you think about guys not being attracted to girls if aesthetically they aren't the most beautiful, even if their soul and their character and their personality are so lovely? <laughs> I mean, it happens. I don't know. Uh, there's more than beauty, but you have both. <laughs> what do you mean? You have am amazing energy and beauty. I'm very attracted to a funny woman. Are I you? Find, I find comedy in a woman very attractive. Yeah. Have you ever been with a girl who aesthetically is very ugly, but is very funny? No. No? I've been with the other, the other way around, yes. Someone who's pretty, but not funny. Right. What's her name? It's my wife. <laughs> <laughs> say that again, but uh, but say it like uh, uh, my wife. Do it like that. Okay, it's my wife. Yeah, <laughs> my wife. Yeah. <laughs> okay, like Borat. You think like I'm a, I'm like Borat? I don't know what that is. Borat. 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 No, you are kidding. I don't. I really don't know what that is. What you're. It's not a big deal. I don't know what you're talking about. Borat, the character, the. I'm not joking. I don't know what you're talking about. Now you're being weird, so we can move past it. <laughs> okay. Should I know who that is? <laughs> what is Borat? Um, Sasha Baron Cohen's like Yeah, I know character. Sasha Baron Cohen. I, Bruno, you mean? No. Bruno's the gay one. <laughs> Borat is the foreign one. Oh, I don't know Borat. Okay. Yeah. You should, you should, okay. Anyway, so tell Borat. me about your wife. <laughs> she's uh, pretty, but boring? No, she's really interesting, but not funny. Oh. All right, on to the next. <laughs> um, so what, you know, in the in the movie, uh, John has... Are you nervous? Yeah. Yeah? You get nervous a lot? I mean, I'm out of my comfort zone. So. Are you always nervous when you're at home? Are you nervous? No. <laughs> Only when I'm in front of, like, interesting, beautiful people. Okay. But, okay, so in the movie... John's parents are, uh, you know, his foster parents. He ha doesn't have a good relationship with that, with them. You have a complete... Like, which, by the way, is very similar to the movie Like Mike, but we could get to that if it happens, <laughs> but go on. No, I'm saying, like, with you, it's a little different. You have a really good relationship with your parents. Were, were they overprotective, like like Sarah Connor? Were they... Uh, what, how, how did My they... mother was just like Sarah Connor. <laughs> was... But I also want to acknowledge the similarities with Like Mike. Okay. Because a lot of people don't realize this, but it was an homage to Terminator because... His foster, his, the person in charge of his foster care, Bow Wow's character, mm -hmm. um, was, I don't remember the actor's name, but he played um, Marty McFly's dad from Back to the Future. Mm -hmm. And that is a, an homage to the um, to the, the time travel that was in Terminator 2. Okay. Do you have the word homage in Spain? Yeah. How do you say it in Spanish? 
You say, uh, I'm trying to, I, that word just blank out of my mind. If, 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 if it's a guy, is it homage -o? No. <laughs> Homenaje. 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 For both boys hey, and girls. That sounds like you would something you would say before a toast. Like, <laughs> hey, homenaje. <laughs> oh. So yeah, my mom is is kind of like Sarah Connor, where like um the world revolves around me. Um yeah. and I am the greatest thing <laughs> that ever happened to humanity. But she's not like Sarah Connor because she doesn't do pull ups. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. What about your dad? What uh, was your? <clears throat> I mean, I've seen him a lot in your podcast. Like you have, I mean, I feel like you have a really good relationship with yeah. them. How do they? <laughs> so employ? similar to John Connor, um, <laughs> my dad impregnated my mom to have me. Right. Um, <laughs> but but unlike John Connor, my dad is older than me. Um, <laughs> but similar to John Connor, my dad <laughs> looks younger than me. <laughs> but unlike John Connor, um, my dad is. He's not a military <laughs> brat. I'll tell you that right now. Okay. Yeah, he doesn't. Uh, he doesn't even drink warm liquids. Did you know that? No. S soup, hot chocolate, tea, coffee, never, none, no oh. warm liquids. Okay. Um, Why is that? I, I don't. He doesn't know. He just doesn't like them. Okay. Which is, you know, good luck. You know, yeah. saving the world <laughs> when you're afraid of soup. <laughs> but you know, I don't mean to speak negatively. I love him. You know, and in fact. He's so my father is <clears throat> he's a businessman, but it's odd because he doesn't really like I don't know if he even thinks about money because he you know he's a rug store and he doesn't even have customers anymore. Everybody at Marshall Rug Gallery is family. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's coming. Um Please hold it's it's thirty five seconds, just let it run. <laughs> okay. Is that the let main? It, just let it finish. Okay. Oh, and we're back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, how how did the relationship with your parents influence your career path? <sighs> That's a really good question. <sighs> <laughs> I learned to do that when you're being interviewed. You're supposed to when somebody's <laughs> nervous. You're supposed to be like. And like to let them know that it's a good question. You can't just say it. You right. Have to, you, have you, to, have to, you have to feel it. You actually have to have thoughts. Okay. So you go like this. You First, before you do it, you have to be like, you have to take it in. And then you have to realize. And like you got like. So I'm going to start doing that more. I, I, I feel like that's what Arnold does in the movie, right? He's learning this the social cues. Is that what you went through? Uh, kind of. Although, you know, I don't believe that Arnold was real. I believe that. Arnold was learning them, okay. not, not, not the, the T-100. No, no I, I don't because there's some things in that movie that that I'm okay with for comedic effect, but I, I question because it kind of breaks the world. Like there's a, uh, I think it was when he was down, when they go and they're getting all the weapons. Um, he's Uncle Bob, which by the way, I have an Uncle Bob, why I remember this. Uh, he, he says, he, John Connor says, oh, this is my Uncle Bob. And then the, the guy's like, oh, all right. Like he knows it's not Uncle Bob. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he's been yeah. around the block they look at the weapons and they go down and there's all the the, the weaponry and he has like the minigun um and arnold i say arnold intentionally arnold takes it and looks at connor and goes <laughs> it's like he what is that did he learn to, that's arnold making a comedic choice right so i feel that it's different because arnold knew what he was doing <laughs> so he was doing it to the t as the t100 okay um, there's, there's social cues and, you know, like the way certain responds, I didn't know I was supposed to do, and I didn't have a John Connor to tell me. So no, it's, it's not the same, but I will say that, uh, my parents influenced my career path because they said something that is, maybe this is going to sound really corny. I shouldn't say it. Oh, well, you used to say it. No, it's stupid. I would really like to hear it. I mean, it's something that all parents should be doing with their children. Okay. No, you're going to make fun of me. They believed in me. Mm -hmm. They wanted me to do what makes me happy. Hi, SOS VHS fans. As you know, on top of being a producer, one of my biggest passions is teaching and helping the next generation of podcast producers and content creators achieve their dreams. So if you want to be like us, go to 7 or click the link below and sign up for a one-week bootcamp course in August. I'll see you there.
And how did you learn that this is what makes you happy? Well, you know, when I was uh, seven <laughs> and older, I uh, sometimes I would make people laugh. Mm -hmm. And I always recognized a laugh. I didn't know what people were thinking all, all the time, but I knew when there was a laugh, I felt, huh, we're here together. Uh, and I definitely took advantage of that because I found that by saying things in a funny way, I could say things that would otherwise have been disregarded. So I, uh, I started to be silly um, and big, big energy uh, to, to communicate, to, to, to communicate with people. So when I decided to do stand-up for the first time, I did it because um, I was curious about it. I didn't know that's what I wanted to do. And then uh, I did a joke where I go, uh, uh, you know, I'll send you a clip of my first set. But I'm like, oh, I think I could do this. And look at me now. I have a podcast. A um, couple of so, shows. Yeah, TV shows are easy to get, though. Are they? This is hard. Okay. Yeah. I, yes. Technically, yes, I'm on two TV shows. But I mean, <laughs> whatever, you know, it's like if, if all I was interested in money, sure, I'm making a lot of it. <laughs> um, if all I wanted to do was like to, to be interesting and creative, like, yeah, <clears throat> sure. It's simple. But podcasts, that's what's important. Okay. Could you get me on Joe Rogan? <laughs> sure. I can, I can make some calls. That, is that the dream? No. <laughs> no. No, the dream is, uh, the dream is to make money having <laughs> conversations with friends. Okay. I've been doing this for years. No, yeah. But I, now I, now you know, thanks to Helix Sleep. If you go to helixsleep.com slash Tyso to get up to $200 all mattress orders and two free pillows. Like, which by the way, have you ever slept on a Helix? I love Helix. I, seriously? Yeah. Do you use a Helix? Yeah. I do. Unbelievable mattress. <laughs> you know, the only thing I've been sleeping on was how great of a mattress they are and now I'm sleeping on one of them. Awesome. Yeah. Helix SOS VHS. Why would you do that? If I'm here as a, are you paying me for this? <laughs> no. Let me just. Sure. So what? Tyso. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. So. Do you want to take off your clothes? Are you? Are you thinking I, I want to be sweating? I think you're a little hot. I'm, do I look good? You look, you look really good. And also, I don't, I'm somebody who's, I'm a little judgmental. Okay. I am judgmental. Yeah. And one of the things I'm a little judgmental towards, I think leather jackets are silly. <laughs> I think they're antiquated. I think they're kind of corny. I think they're, it's like. I feel like you're trying to be, ha, look a certain way, but that jacket is very reminiscent of the style of, of, of Schwarzenegger. Of cool. Of that time, and I do think it's cool. Yeah. But I think the leather pants are... are <laughs> yeah, we could do without. Take them off. <laughs> take them off. Look, if I were you, I would take them off, but I, I can't. Why would you do it if, if you were me? I would show my muscles. Oh, I thought you were talking about my schwanz. No. All right. But I, I saw that you, you are interested in that. I, I saw a clip on Instagram. So do you, do you think the Terminators have a big dick? Uh, next question, please. <laughs> <laughs> so I think... What is this? Five, five, five years ago, uh, I think you, you, you said that you were diagnosed with uh, level one autism. I have, um, I have a, a response to the uh, Terminator having a big dick. Thing. Okay. Will you ask again? Yeah. Okay. Do you think that Terminators have a big dick? I don't know, but RoboCop has a hell of a boner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask. Yeah. You. Good, good. Good. Yeah, good. You're, you're quick. Um, so, yeah. Thanks. Uh, five years ago, uh, I think, uh, you were diagnosed with level one autism. Six years ago. Six years ago. Okay. And then how did that change the way you perceive your your uh, growing up and, and all of that, all the... I guess weirdness that you you have. Oh, the what? Weirdness. What do you mean? <laughs> like, like things that we talk about, like the the social cues or not not knowing exactly what those were, or you have to learn. But why or, weird? Why did you say weird? Or different? Yeah, I mean everyone's different. F fine. Uh, are you mad at me? No. So what are you saying? <laughs> you saying that autistic people are weird? No. I mean, you did like, say that. Well, I did say like they are, yeah, they, they perceive things differently from the norm. Don't you? 
Huh? Is, are, are, are all people from Spain autistic? They are a little bit, yes. Really? No. Uh, no, I, I just feel like sometimes, <laughs> like that, the, yeah, okay, you, so, <laughs> you said that you thought you had friends. And you can then, go back. I, I was messing around. You no, can, I know, you can I know. ask a question. I know. I, I, no, I liked it. I liked it. Okay. Uh, well, somebody tell your you, face. You put, put me in the spot. Uh, but wait a second. So let, let me rephrase. You, you told me that or you, you said that you, when you were a kid, you thought you were, uh, you, you belonged to a group of friends. And <laughs> Seriously, that, on the thing? Okay. <laughs> okay. So, and, but then you realize one day that... Is it supposed to be? Does it matter that it's doing that? <laughs> The, the, the under the light switch with the plant. Okay. okay. All right, go ahead. Okay. Thank you for that. <laughs> I knew you were gonna derail me. Um, it's all right. Derail isn't that kind of like having sex with somebody and then going back in time before you had sex with them? Is that what it is? Mm -hmm. Oh, I in, in the states. In the in, the, in the, that's a new. Okay, yeah. sorry. Like, I misused like, the word. Like if you're hooking up with somebody and you just want to forget it, I just want to derail them. Okay. Yeah. Is that what you do? Do you derail a lot of people? I, I don't want to talk about this kind of stuff. <laughs> okay. like, that's my personal business. <laughs> okay. Can we talk about the autism? <laughs> I think we've been. <laughs> <laughs> I think for you it's a superpower. You want to fuck me? I'll fuck you. <laughs> I was going to end the interview with that. Okay. I guess. <laughs> but you'll just stand up <laughs> and I'll just... <laughs> Fine. So you were talking to me about all the people in Spain are autistic? <laughs> no, I was going to talk about you and how. I mean, I think for you, I don't know if you discovered this early on that you that was your superpower. But uh, I, f I feel it is. I feel like you, you, you Sorry, channel that. I couldn't that. hear you. Say it again. <laughs> <clears throat> I had my headphones off for a minute. <laughs> okay. Um, Rick. Hi, Rick. Hi. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. Um, well, I think you have an amazing energy. <laughs> and I want to know, when did you learn that you have this energy? Uh, when did I learn I had this energy? Probably when I was 27. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. So. <laughs> what is that question? When did you? I get it that, that like, I'm thrown, I'm like being a little, as you would say, weird because no, I have autism. I love weird. But. But what was the question that you really wanted to ask me? Can we move that at least, though? <laughs> Moved. <laughs> Good sounds. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the question I really wanted to ask you. Okay, here it is. It's like... One sec. Go ahead. Hold on. Okay, wait. How does... Wait, one sec. Go ahead. How did your diagnosis... Diagnosis <laughs> change the way you perceive your uh, your life until that point. Mm. Well, uh, the diagnosis offered me more information into what autism is, and as I looked more into it, I started to recognize some things in my life that were seemingly unrelated. Some of the troubles I would get into, or some of the social obstacles I had, um, some of the ways I would see things or not see things that then kind of got packaged together as, oh, this is all kind of related. Uh, it helped me better understand, um, helped me better understand that other people think differently than me, which maybe is an obvious statement to make as an adult, but uh, I didn't, like a, a very big, kind of the start of the new awareness that I came into, which, you know, if I, my focus was here, I'm now like here. But I'm also aware that there's so much I don't see. I never, I didn't, I was unaware that I was unaware. And now I know, oh, I, I can't fill in these blanks. Thank so you. growing up, you didn't feel any sort of like isolation. You felt like right in. What? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, you know, uh, on a, on a, there were times where I felt unincluded. Yeah, there were times I felt unincluded. Um, growing up, like, like uh, middle school, because uh, I grew up in a in an, in a in like this place where like there was a lot of kids on my street that went to my school, and they were all friends. 
and they would play outside. And um, I would play outside with them. But then when they would go inside, I wasn't allowed in. Okay. Uh, and I remember the feeling of that feeling bad, but I didn't get it. I don't just mean I didn't get why I wasn't allowed in. I didn't get what that meant. I guess I just can't be, I'm friends with them, just I'm friends with them outside. So I, I didn't really understand that feeling. And then as I got older, um, to your point, people were a bit nicer or at least less obvious with, you can't come in. Um, but I wasn't really <clears throat> like going to parties or asked to do stuff. I wasn't really included, but but everyone was very nice to me. Okay. Nobody bullied me. How could they? <laughs> I do uh, uh in 5th grade uh there's uh you're, you're in four classes. You have four teachers. There's there's your history, science, math and uh what else do you take? That's how it goes in America. In 5th grade at least. Okay. Those are your five classes. Uh at least those five teachers and maybe you learn some other stuff, but you would bounce around between these four rooms. I remember there's there's four rooms. The the grade was split into two. There's the these four rooms for half the class. These four rooms for the other half the class. There was nine rooms. Four here, four here, and there was this middle room, and that was for um, I don't know what they would call out. Let's call them developmentally challenged, uh, having some types of obstacles. I don't know. But um, one of my teachers said, I think you would like uh, helping kids in there, like go teach them or talk to them or play with them, because I had a lot of energy. And I remember thinking like, Yeah, I'll do that. And how nice, look at, I'm doing like this thing where I'm helping out some people or whatever. And I didn't realize until later, like, oh no, that's just, <laughs> they put me in that class for one of the periods. Um, <laughs> and I, I didn't know, okay. you know, that I, and things were, and I don't know if that was a coincidence or, or a design by, you know, education staff, but I do think it's a great trick, like telling kids to do whatever you want them to do, but framing it in a way where like, you're helping people and you're collaborating. It also felt like, ooh, these are people that now like me. Um, but point is, yeah, looking back, I realized, oh, I was just in these special classes and these special things and um, I didn't really have many friends, but I never knew that. And I think that's such a luxury because I was f always falsely so confident. I'm the best. I am phenomenal. Put up a thumbnail, let people know. Um... <laughs> And then when I was diagnosed with autism and I realized that, oh, people might see differently and that's not the case, it was really like a, uh, it was a tough time. Um, but now I've gotten back to where like the idea of self-acceptance and how you feel about yourself is how, what, I mean, how I felt about myself is how I was for 30 years of my life. And when I look back at it, I'm now, I laugh at some of the things I realized, but I felt great. I felt happy. I felt... I felt uh, valuable, um, and this is a kind of a corny statement I'm about to say, but I mean it, but like, it almost is a choice to like, oh, I'm great. You still have to be aware of when you're stepping on other people's toes, I guess, but like, perspective, it, it, I got lucky having a perspective as a kid that uh, I thought people liked me. Okay. But you also said that you went into basketball a little older, like in high school, because you I, wanted to... Because of Pep. I, is that Pep? With, okay. the, with the kids jumping out the windows, <laughs> yeah. also jumping jumping out of the gym. <laughs> and uh, I started playing basketball there. I never played really basketball. I remember I would play because I always wore khakis. So I would always play in my khakis. And uh, I got uh, a teacher accidentally hit me while we were playing, like hitting like the way, like playing basketball. But he was wearing a ring. And if I could, it's to this... Ever since then, I th it's fucking crazy. When I'm guarding somebody or they're guarding me and they're wearing jewelry, even if it's a necklace, I ask them, hey, um, I don't ask them to take it off because they're not going to say, hey, uh, tuck that, will you please tuck that on your shirt? And there's been a couple times they say no and I have picked up their shirt and put the, the thing in because uh, I, 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 yeah, it's so fucking disrespectful. He hit me and I had a mark on my face and I remember I wasn't in my regular school but I asked my school, could I go home, Can I go back to school for picture day in case I get out of pep in time? I want to have a picture in the yearbook. And I didn't. I have a just a, a big thing from being hit. Um, but that got me into basketball. And then when I when I came back half days to school, uh, 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 Tim, I'm not saying last names on purpose, but I mean, great yeah. guy. Shout out to Tim. Um, 
He asked if I play basketball. And I remember I said yes, because I wanted to be included in something. But I didn't really play much. I just got hit by a teacher a couple of times. <laughs> and uh, then I just like loved it because I had something to do after school. And I started like, I got this little community of people that played basketball and we would play. So the thing that got me into basketball was um, friends, being included, collaborating, being part of something with other people. Um, yeah. So then I just kept doing that. I got good at it because I kept doing that. When, when do you become good? By started playing college? basketball at the end of ninth grade. Um, I was first able to dunk literally a week after senior year ended. Uh, and then I kept playing a lot. My, yeah, college. That's sophomore <laughs> year, I got good. Freshman year, I was, I was like, you know, I could play. But sophomore year is when I started like, I would go into the gym and there was like a long wait. But like people who were next like wanted to get me. And like, we got Glassman. And I was like, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm the best. Is that, is that when you started uh, getting girls because you, you were able to do that? What is getting, what do you mean by getting girls? Like, really, like, what do you mean by getting girls? Like, dating, like, approaching girls, being like, you know, getting not rejected. <laughs> that laugh is so funny. <laughs> I mean, it gets rejected so much. You know, like, not getting rejected. Ah. <laughs> um, I don't know. I guess, uh, seen, I had my first girlfriend, uh, we started dating just before senior year ended. We stayed together my freshman year of college. Broke up July, going into my sophomore year. Was s sad for a year. They didn't hook up with many girls in college. I just had too much respect for them. Okay. I think it's so important that, that women get the education. Right. And dating you would have prevented them from getting an education? No, I'm just saying like... <laughs> I have so much respect for women that go to school. Right. So you don't have sex with people you respect. What do, I mean, that's why you married somebody who's not funny, right? Right. <laughs> no, I only have sex with people I respect. All right. Um, okay, so... Yeah. Okay. Um, but wait, you said is that when you started getting girls, like, do I have a reputation? Like, do girls... Like, what's, what's my reputation? In I think your reputation is that you... I mean, I don't know if you're a player, but you, that you date no. a lot. I mean, I date a lot. That you... They had a lot of different girls. Where did this come from? I don't by, know. First the, of all, by the way, this idea of cool, yeah. I, I do feel like, ooh, that's cool because cool that's is cool. cool is burned into your brain in high school. And then right. that's what's cool for forever. That's why people still dress like they're in high school. So being with a lot of girls to me still is cool, but that's not a thing that's that's me. But, but I love that I have that reputation. Tell me what you heard. I heard that... Uh, Tell me f what you heard. I heard that you just ah. dated a lot of different girls. How'd you hear this? Wikipedia? Yeah. Wikipedia. It's not on Wikipedia. <laughs> so it's not, it's, how did you hear that? Who's talking about me with girls? It's, uh, Are yes. you not wanting to burn your source? Is that why you don't right. be the person? It's like you, you, you know, somebody you, or people told you. You tell the scene, but not the sinner. Huh? <laughs> Am I a sinner? No, I'm just saying. You don't have to tell me the phrase. person. There's a phrase. That did says, one person? Did two people? Did five people? Did you read it? Like, Are there a lot of people saying there's, Rick hooks up with a lot of girls? There's a couple people that I've talked to that they have said, "Hey, cool." The, Rick dates a lot of different girls. Nice. And what do they say? Like, how do I treat them and how do they feel? Are they pleasured? No, that, 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 that's the end of my inquiry. So um, you didn't ask them any questions. Somebody says, hey, Rick hooks up with a lot of girls. You're like, all right, I'll okay, bring that I'll, up. I'll ask him about it. Right. No. You don't have a girlfriend. Well, you know, I, it's, I don't, I, I'm not or, public at the moment about this, <laughs> but let's just say I may, have been, I may be seeing somebody. Oh, I see. Okay. Someone you respect? I wouldn't be seeing them if I don't. Okay. This is a serious thing. Okay. Okay. You never know. Fine. But uh, is she funny? <laughs> yeah, she is. Okay. If she exists, I'm not saying this is real. <laughs> right. Because this is my personal life. Okay. But uh, if she, if she were real, then she's not. Um, yeah, she's funny, and uh, dude, <sighs> bro. <laughs> Can we move that? It's it's so fucking it's it's right on me. Could we? Okay. It's moved. Um here. What? Let's do a scene from Terminator 2. There you are. Um Okay, I <laughs> can I ask you a silly question? I, I got it. Can I ask you a silly question? Yeah. Uh, we put on your glasses for a second. <laughs> These ones are not prescription, so I can't see. 
anything. When you are having sex with your wife, do you ever, uh, and you want her to climax, do you ever say, come with me if you want to live? I, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. How do you know? Uh, it's just <laughs> it's in the ether. Like give you... <laughs> You could hear me fine without the headphones? Yes. Hear you perfectly. Um, okay. So, uh, I All want... this was on one page, huh? <laughs> I have plenty of pages. Um... Rick. Oh. Hey, Rick. Welcome, welcome to the show. Um, so, was playing LeBron James like playing with the Terminator? Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that honest answer. Um, <laughs> okay. Let me address the question. If you could send a Terminator back in time, what would uh, what would you uh, entrust him with? What would I inject him with? No. What would, what would his mission be? Well, I have two. Do you want me to send him back to 2008 or 1993? You choose. You are in charge. Fine. I'll send it back to 1993. Okay. I'd have him pick up a whole bunch of sealed starter decks of Alpha, Beta, Unlimited. I have him grab a whole bunch of booster boxes of Arabian Nights. And um, I would also have him buy up a whole bunch. Not enough to take him out of the marketplace where people can't enjoy them, nor to stop value from them. But I would want to have a lot of Power 9. Black Lotuses, the Moxes, Time Twisters, uh, Time Walks, Ancestral Recall. I'd want a lot of Magic Cards. <laughs> okay. A lot of them. Um. <laughs> And then uh, I guess I would uh, have him go uh, find me and tell me to start playing basketball a little earlier. Okay. You know what? I wouldn't. I don't know how far that butterfly effect would have, but I'll tell you this much. I'll, to make sure that doesn't happen, I would have him then not give me those cards until the end of this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Yeah. Okay. You, you, you thought about this. No. Uh, <laughs> no? They just came up with that. Yes. Okay. Imagine if I thought about what I would do with a Terminator. <laughs> Are you imagining it? I am. Um... Pretty silly, right? <laughs> yeah. Because why Terminator? Why not just go back in time? Why why not just me go back in time or have okay. just you know the information? Okay, if you were going back in time, what would you do? If you could go back in time. To 1993 or 2008? 2008 this time. <laughs> uh, I would have him I would buy a lot of Bitcoin. <laughs> okay. And I would tell Rick that too bad he didn't start playing basketball earlier. You would have to sell the, also you did the, the information that you have to sell that Bitcoin by a certain time, no? It's, it's, very, it's still very valuable. I mean, back then it was, you know, under a dollar. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you just want money. Get rid of the just. You just want money. Get rid of the just. <laughs> Do you, <laughs> I don't know how to. Do you want money? Sure. What do you got? I want money. Okay. But the thing is to go back in time, I don't want to change things. Okay. So if I don't want to change anything, what's the point other than supplementing myself now? So like, I think an easy one is money. I mean, yeah, because I mean, the, the only thing that matters are podcasts <laughs> and I already have a hit one. Okay. I, okay. So what about this? If you had to send someone back in time to Terminator? To yeah, or someone back in time to fuck your mom. I don't like this question. You know, <laughs> who, who will you send? I don't like this question. Okay, <laughs> let's move on. Okay. Okay. Let's move on. Okay. All right. Um, <laughs> all right. So nervous. You made me nervous. Oh, you Look. talking about fucking my mom? You fucking coward. <laughs> Okay, what about this? If a stand up if stand up comedians, you know, were to fight against the machines, who would be the leader? That's a good question. <laughs> Don't believe you this time. Bert Kreischer. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, why? Well, I mean his nickname is the machine. I just figured that's <laughs> right. That's that's the pun, right? Okay. Who would you be in that group? Rick. Right. In terms of like your your hierarchy in the in the group Did you say hi ricky hierarchy. hi yeah. ricky <laughs> um i would be you know probably the sixth lead ah uh -huh. you really <laughs> okay we'll put up a 
Um, yes, yes, definitely. All your promotion. You're good at this too. Um, so when did you learn that you were funny? Funny enough that you were going to just put your ex in that basket and become a stand-up comedian? Because that's a risky move. I didn't move here for stand-up. I moved here because I want to be an actor. Okay. But I was doing stand-up because I loved it, because I liked it. And um, it was easier to get on stage than in front of a camera. So I didn't feel like I was putting everything into stand-up comedy. I, that was just something I was doing because I liked it. Uh, I was making friends. You know, basketball and stand-up are a very similar thing to me for as far as a driving force because uh, it was a community that I was allowed to be a part of. And actually, basketball helped me a lot in the comedy community because when I first moved here, I was playing basketball with comedians, some of which who I knew of from television who didn't know who I was and like, I ended up becoming peers with them because we would be playing basketball together. So uh, stand-up is it was and is a community that I felt a part of. So I wanted to keep doing it. And it wasn't because like, this is the dream and I'm going to make it. It became a dream because this is great. Imagine getting paid. But I never felt like this is what it is because I was always... Like when I first came here, my job was doing background work uh, in film and television and paid audience work for TV shows and stuff. Mm -hmm. so like I was around it and I was making a little bit of money and I had friends and I was doing comedy and it just felt like this is the best and I'm paying my bills so I never th I didn't think about like you want to become more successful it really was just truly the idea of like enjoying the journey without even thinking about that consciously I was just loving doing it and then fortunately I started getting work and it's like holy shit this is like a real thing but it was I didn't feel like it was a huge gamble the big thing that felt like a big choice was choosing to move to Los Angeles. But that wasn't based on, am I going to make it in showbiz? I mean, just if you move, you move somewhere. If you pay your bills here, you could pay and or here. Like what, what's the difference? When did I think I was funny? I always thought I was funny. I always thought it was funny. When I first started doing stand up, and by from first starting to like first like eight plus years, I always felt like sometimes I'm really funny on stage, but I didn't feel ready. I, I, I Maybe I was, maybe I wasn't. I wasn't. I felt like I will be because I always felt like I'm really funny. I haven't figured out how to control it um, and how to have people who don't yet know me digest it. I still that way a lot with my comedy. I think even my podcast, like I get so many comments and messages where I think people think they're being nice and they are saying a nice thing, but it's basically I hated Rick at first and now I love him or it's one of my favorite pods or whatever. And, and I've commented back on something like genuinely asking Please, like I, I have no ego with this. Please tell me what, why? What does that mean? People don't know what I'm doing or like what I'm doing, whatever it may be. But like, there has been this obstacle that I have gotten better at, but has always existed, even though it doesn't exist as much now. Which is, when somebody does a joke and it doesn't work, usually the audience just thinks, "Oh, that wasn't funny." But for whatever reason, some of the choices and the things that I do when they don't work, it's not only is it not funny, it's like, fuck that guy, you know, whatever. So when I miss, and I missed a lot, it's like, they don't like me as opposed to family guy when they miss, it doesn't matter, the next one's up. Mm -hmm. um, so I always felt like I'm funny, but I don't know how to do this yet. And there, even though now I feel like I'm, I'm very good, I really think I'm a very good stand-up comedian and I think that I'm great. I'm great at the thing that I do. I don't know if the thing that I do has a huge space mm. and if that's what is the most valuable, but I like the thing that I do and I'm the, I think I'm the best at it. Um, but I still, there is this thing in me that's like, I don't know if I figured it out yet. And I, I think that's something that might always be the case. Uh, yeah. It makes you want to not be satisfied and keep trying stuff. But I said on my podcast before, I think being funny is very easy. Um, but the but stand up, like and more specifically, like the business of comedy is really hard. Yeah. Um, the craft of it. But I, uh, you're talking about something that reminds me of the first time when when you came to Bad Friends for the first time. I don't know if you remember. Um, it's the only time I've done it. Yeah. Right. So there there is a a rhythm to the show and you came in and I guess instead of like fitting in with that rhythm, you decided to, okay, wait a second, we're going to do my thing. Sure. So I feel, is that what you're talking about? Like, like disrupting whatever it is that, you know, the, the flow and now we're going to, everybody's going to go around what I do it. Um, 
I am coming in, I'm a guest. So one could argue then be the guest and let them take control. The other is I'm the guest, make me comfortable. (laughs) So like the whole time I was trying to find it and I've had Bobby on three times and and Andrew on twice and they're they're some of both because of the the audience they bring in, but also because the podcast themselves, some of the most viewed on my channel. I fucking love them. I love playing with them so much. Right. The combination with them and and Santino not being there, it made it really tough. So my the option I had was, and I was aware of this, was accept that this isn't working <laughs> or just fucking swing, man, and just try to find some stuff. Right. Um, and leaning in, and then Bobby's going to bully me, and Santino's going to take <laughs> one of our sides. And it's I, I know that dynamic, and right. I'm very comfortable in it. Um, and it was a weird because we we never got in a pocket. There were moments that it, was like it worked, but there was never a pocket. And much like anybody, especially us, we thrive in the pocket. And with that much chaos, if you're not in it, it's just fucking chaos. Yeah. Um, it is what it is. It was you're capturing a, a moment in time, and not everything connected. The co- I am surprised at the polarization of that episode because. It was a fucking clusterfuck. And the fact that that I know a lot of people still loved it, and I think they're wrong, you know. It, but no, but it, I had that, the, the same thing that you just described as like, I hated it while we were doing it because in my head, I had a plan for the show, right? right? And then you came in and you're just like, oh, that the plan is gone. Mm-hmm. But after a while, after getting into the new plan, now it's like, oh, it's a very odd episode that works really well, although it's not, how we do it i do agree that there were beats that worked very well and very funny <laughs> right um question for you the plan that you had that we weren't doing did you experience a moment where the plan things organically weren't going to plan or did you feel like there was a wrench thrown in does that question make sense <laughs> yes yeah i think the wrench i think like you came in and you start getting the gong and, and stopping and, and stopping every and we, I mean, we're not a guest-driven show, and we don't have that many guests. But when we have some guests, we're like, they just, you know, they decide to do an improv, and the guest goes against it. It's like it's clearly that it's gonna derail the show, and sometimes that makes me laugh a lot. But I was thinking like, oh, that you describe basically what I felt with you, like, oh, this is weird, like different from what I am expecting, and then oh, I really like this guy, and I really like how he does things. And that got me into your podcast and how you, you know what I'm saying? Like, like discover who you were and how you did comedy different than they do. Obviously, everybody does it different. But this show was I don't very... show my penis all the time. <laughs> right, you don't, you don't. But also, like, these I shows that do, but... we were, these shows we were against, I guess they're all the same, like two comedians just riffing, like right. you decided to do something a little different. And there's another, there's another variable in there, which is Bobby Lee, and more specifically, <laughs> me with Bobby. Right. But the point I was making is there were, there's a lot of people, and thank you for having me on it, because a lot of people found me from there that either said they loved it, it was their favorite episode, or they hated it, it was their least favorite episode. Yeah. And that's why they came over. Like, who is this fucking guy? <laughs> right. And then they started really liking it. And yeah, it's this thing. And I think that the reason people don't like me at first and then do, I'm sure some people liked me at first, is there are so many different versions of the way we could do things and if you watch any podcast of mine it's probably gonna be very different from the one before and the one after so if you see one that you like great if you see one that you don't you're just really not gonna like me right and i think if people for whatever reason give me a a chance and this is gonna sound corny but i mean this in socially in general like to have a sample of somebody here you don't know enough uh generally it's like oh he's like playing and a lot of times I'm playing and I have this thing where everyone knows I'm playing, but they don't. <laughs> right. They don't know I'm playing. Um, and that's fucking crazy to me. I'm in there in a three-piece tweed suit with a gong. I'm fucking joking, man. I've known these guys for a decade. I'm joking. Right. But you know what they say, so I don't want to bore no, you with it. No, no, no. I, I, I think you have, that's what I'm saying, that you have that energy. Like, And I understand the people that if they had a expectation that was more, oh, comedy is like ABC and then you just read order those letters then it's like it takes a, a bit to get into it um okay I wanna, let me i want to add one more thing to the, the, the right choice with it, where yeah. it's the wrong choice where it's subjective right. like that i could make a choice and based on the way bobby lee responds my choice was hysterical or was the wrong choice right it's all i mean i i talk about this with with my anyone who helped edits with me how important reaction shots are and how much we need to show 
the person responding either to highlight how much something didn't work or to show that it's okay and anywhere in between. But it's not even the choice. It's the chemistry. So like it's really hard to develop the instincts when the choices are dictated from an external force. It's not stand up. It's other people. If I say something that makes you uncomfortable and it ruined the show, that was a mistake. If I say something that challenged you in a way that let you either come back to me or m- brought it into something interesting and funny, what a f- great fucking choice. So I, I live from a place of, I, I love my choice. Bl- I'm confident in my choices. Yeah, yeah. And I know operational cost is a miss. <laughs> and you need to try. If not, I'm going to do it. Right. And I just hope that the person opposite me is comfortable enough to do their thing <laughs> instead of thinking I'm messing their thing right. up. Right. Right. That's a, yeah, very valid point. Okay, so I want to go back to a little bit uh, silly time, but uh, I heard your you have a musical also background. Like your 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 grandfather was a uh, uh, arranged and, and and produced music for Ray, Ray Charles. Uh, your cousin Teddy, who you have on uh, on the show a lot, like. Um, plays i mean he's an unbelievable he's player he's, right also it's really cool like uh in two and a half men he's he's made a, a great living he does <laughs> jingles for like commercials and stuff yeah so and and he brought up in one of your show that actually he was friends or is friends with a composer of uh you know brad fidelli who composed the music for terminator 2 so i wait he teddy said that yeah that he works with he, Fidel? he was friends uh, I don't or, remember that or didn't know that. It's amazing. Yeah, and and I was like, oh, is where where is your your music bong come from? I guess. No, he's talking to me. <laughs> um, I'm sure. I mean, I do believe there's a genetic aspect to it. My grandfather was an amazing musician. Um, I've always liked music. I was able to play, figure out things, and play on the piano by ear. What really got me into it? I always liked piano, but I had a, a huge crush on. Uh, uh, a girl named Amanda who lived near me and her brother was a great musician, mm-hmm. Michael. Um, and I would go over there to ask him to teach me things. Like he would listen to any song and be able to play it way better than me. Um, so I would go so I could say hi to her and uh, then we would play for hours and then I would leave so I could say bye. So I was kind of motivated by by seeing her and then I just got good at the piano with playing with Michael. Okay. Um I also really want to be able to sing uh, and I'm not the best singer in the world, but like I could hear what I want and it, I get frustrated. Like I know what I want. I don't have that instrument in my voice, but I could do it on the piano. So it's like, it's, it's getting thoughts out too. It's like, I hear something. I want to be able to, you know, if you think something, how do you express it? I don't mean that in such a spiritual way of expressing myself. I literally mean, I want to get this out and it feels good to get it out. Um, that's what the piano is for me. And, and what about the rapping that that's, quick mind that you have to like you know you can do you do the acronyms you do the you know you 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 can come up with songs i made i made beats that? In, i made beats in college on this app people probably remember <laughs> fruity loops uh-huh. um and there were uh, a few guys on my floor uh this year where i started making beats that um we would have these freestyle nights like you would come over i make beats and we would always rap on it and similar to what i said about basketball or comedy like Ooh, I felt connected in friends and this is so fun. It was just play, you know, basketball, comedy, rapping. It's all play when you're doing it with people. And um, I just like doing it. Um, I also uh, rhythmically, I know how to do things. I know, like I said, I know the way things sound, even if it's a, a most of the time, it's a joke the way I'm doing it. But I know how I want to make something sound and it feels good. Even though it's silly, it still feels good to be in a pocket, you know, Um I think that's it. It just feels good. Yeah. It feels good to do, you know, dancing feels good, whether you're good at it or not. And okay. I'm great, <laughs> but it feels good. Right. Yeah. No, I think you have that rhythm and it's like, I watching you doing so many times, like, okay, you, I said that training thing or were you always like, I mean, I just did always do it. So yeah. I don't know if I was, I mean, I guess training. Right. No, I mean, I'm just, I'm just doing it all the time. It's also patterns, you know, it's just like, it's just, it's just, it's just, it just feels, it feels good. I used to, my OCD involved me doing a lot of things where I was tapping and touching and doing. Sometimes it gets to that. But like, I don't know. I've never even thought about this before. But like, there's a, if it's connected, but like there's a de-stressor. There's a, a there's an anti-anxiety of like, of a consistency. I feel this way. Like, I, I go to sleep to white noise. Um, noise is great, but there has to be some type of consistency. If there, I used to go, I still do. Sometimes I'll go to sleep to hip hop. Um, 
uh, well, having the, the a consistent bit. having consistent, there's something comforting about it so like being in it and then like traveling on it and then even if you change it up but then when you do it with somebody else then you're adding like you're playing with them and i just it's just fun it's it's a fun thing to do okay am i i'm a, am i could i have a career as a hip-hop <laughs> artist i really believe uh, i already do <laughs> right um but it is just something that feels good yeah okay a couple more questions and then i'm, I'm uh we're gonna switch uh gears but um so when i saw as we see it uh i see you playing a character that is really far from who you are even if they have you know mm -hmm. autism um when you started working on that do you feel like responsible okay i'm, I'm now gonna create a, a character to uh, i guess as a show that uh shines the light into the issues that some people have with the with autism and the and the um, obstacles. You mean that, weird Spanish people? Yeah, weird Spanish people and other 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 weird weirdos in the in the city. Uh, do do you feel okay? I'm super responsible for it, or how how do you let go, or were you already confident coming from you know the other experiences and let the showrunners take the wheel, and I I I'll just do my job. Can we just cut to a, a clip of me on a talk show talking about this? Oh, yes. Do you already do? So basically, uh, that. Yeah, I felt responsible uh, at first because um, I'm going to be the voice of this thing on a public platform. Um, but I then realized that the only responsibility I have is to tell the story that the showrunner has but also mine like when i'm talking about me and my connections to it made it a lot easier made it a lot easier because like i'm not at first and i don't know if you really showed this clip i'll send it but i the way I, what i said on it was like i didn't want to be a spokesperson for something that i at the time i was still learning about and though i still am i now feel more comfortable with the fact that like i don't have a responsibility i don't have a responsibility to anybody yeah with it um if I'm being honest and authentic and talking about my experiences, maybe somebody could get something out of that. But I don't need to speak for other people. It made it a lot easier um, because, like, because that was so new to me, I felt more, I felt a bigger lack of understanding. Like, I don't feel responsible to speak for Jews. Right. Because I'm Jewish. You know, like, I'm a Jewish guy, obviously. <laughs> And like, you know, take from it what you will. Um, the, the the difference is I'm not now doing press with people asking me about Judaism. Right, but also the show wasn't about that. You didn't but even it. if it was. Okay. Even if it was. Like, even if it was about Judaism, it would be from my point of view right. and or my version of my point of view that I'm putting into this character. Mm -hmm. um, it's when people are asking me such direct questions. How do you connect blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Stuff that I didn't want, I didn't think in that way and... There's two ways of answering that. There's prepping it um, and knowing it's coming. Yeah. Or there's being honest about it. Um, I guess there's three ways. There's also making it up. <laughs> yeah. Sebastian Maniscalco has a joke. I don't remember exactly what it is, but it's something about uh, he was in Home Depot or Lowe's or whatever, and he asked something about a grill, and the guy goes, oh, um, if you... Uh, and Sebastian goes, you're going to make it up? <laughs> like, it's okay to not know. Right. Uh, Press has been that, a lot of that, a lot of me saying things like, I, I don't know. Right. There's a question that they, ask, they always ask people, which is, uh, what drew you to the script? What made you want to do this show? Mm -hmm. And like, you can make up that like, you know, the people involved or I, how important I think the story is, or I think it's very relevant now that, you know, we have women <laughs> of this people or people of color right. or, you know, people on the spec, whatever the thing might be. And like, I always say, and I say always, cause it's always us. It's like, I, I they offered me the job. It's a job. I, yeah, I like I will I'll do anything. <laughs> your, your next job. Yeah, yeah, they're paying you money, good money, right, to do this thing. Like, I I, I don't know. Right. No, it's, I think I think it's a very valid question. Also, it's not a comedy. Do you enjoy like doing all the things on comedy? Dude, love. Uh, I I want to do. Everybody wants to do drama. Right. I wanted. I love it. I also think I'm better at it. A lot of why my stand up didn't work when I first started was because people thought I was being so serious. Like I was being so fucking dramatic and like, obviously I'm joking and they didn't even know in a comedy club. So like, I love playing stuff real, love playing stuff real. I, th I think even in comedy, it's different when you're doing broad comedy 
because that's a very much an energy thing. Yeah. But if the situ- but a proper situation comedy, even in multicams, like the comedy is in the situation, and if you could play it believably, it's funny. Right. I love leaning into that stuff. Yeah, my favorite comedies are always like that, like dramas that are just you know with situations that are a little off. One like, of the funniest funniest uh, uh, scenes to me in any any genre of any show or movie is Scott's Tots in the Office. Do you do you know mm-hmm. that episode? Y- yes. Um, Not a- real quick, people that don't, Michael Scott, Steve Carell offers uh, these twelve year old students that if you graduate high school, I'm going to pay for you to go to college because they knew that would never happen, and he learned that like that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to help the inner city kids or whatever <laughs> it is, and then it comes to a time where it's like, all right, it's time to pay him for college, and you can't. It's so real. It's so uncomfortable. But the reason it's so funny is because it is so real. Things aren't funny if they're not real, unless it's a very funny energy. And that, right. that there's a space for that. That's a different type, yeah. But like, I feel this way with stand-up. You've got to be believable first and then funny. So yeah, I, I love being able to do things that aren't just, you know, talking about grabbing tits, which I love talking about, guilty. And uh, so I know that you like to produce, like kind of like direct, edit your own stuff. Were you thinking ever to write a sitcom or write a tv show or a movie yeah i was writing it so the 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 inception of i am phenomenal was was me recording it was based off of my bill lawrence kicked me out of that basketball game blah 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 that's what it's about Um, that's the same basketball game you were first in and i'm still in now i'm back in that game (laughs) okay well i haven't played a little bit but unrelated um yeah so this thing happened and then I like, I think that I want to make this into a show. And I talked to Bill and Bill wanted to do it with me. So I ended up filming uh, more than half of that stuff. It was different things I filmed that I pieced together. But based on my experience of doing the sixth lead while editing, I realized, oh, I could have done this or this. And so I thought, I want to film something that's like low budget, easy to make and edit it. So I, as to help me write the actual thing, I didn't know if I was going to even share it. Mm -hmm. And then I came up with this concept and we were going out to pitch it. Right when we were going out to pitch, we already had pitches set up. I booked as we see it, it, which is a show about autism. And this was a different show about autism, about like a guy who thinks he's the best in the world and then finds out nobody likes him. And it was a darker, different twist on it. But I wasn't allowed to star in a show at the time while I was on this other show. So I put it on the back burner. Uh, incidentally, my editor and I were going through it and like, this is funny. Let's turn it into something. I filmed a new ending sure. and I, I posted it. Mm-hmm. But the inception of it was because I, I was doing a show I see. Uh, or going out to pitch. Um, and I, I, yeah, I was, I very much want to, I'm more, but you know, everyone's working on stuff, so we'll see. But right. yeah, that's what I, I very much want to do. What I love about that show based on this, conver- on, on that short, I guess we can call it a short film, um, based on this conversation is that you were so self-aware at this point of like every, you know, how people perceive you that you made that twist at the end, that ending, uh, I think goes against. Spoiler alert. Okay. I won't, I won't reveal it, but it's it fine. goes against what you were just saying of yeah. like growing up and not knowing what people, you know, how people perceive it. Yeah, you, you get to an ending where I mean, you're hoping for this character to learn something, but he didn't. But as a director, or as a creator, you, you made that choice. of like, Yeah, it's okay. fun. It, it, it's, you know, if it was a, its own piece, you have the arc and he learns, sure. But I, I, I think there's something very funny in, in the humanness of like, we don't change that much. Yeah. You know, the reason we change isn't because we're supposed to. It's because we gain new perspectives and we want to. Um, but it's funny. It's funny. I mean, always Sunny in Philadelphia is one of the funniest comedies of all time to me because they're so not learned. <laughs> right. Yeah. They keep, they keep funny. the same. Thing. It's funny to be, uh, to, to suck. It's yeah. funny to suck. It's just at least do it on purpose, you right. know, and let people in on it. Right. Versus you know this character who doesn't know but added layer of it's scripted like you know yeah um okay uh last changing gears now or no l- last question and then well two questions and then i'll change gears uh do you have someone in your life like a t1000 uh t1000 uh, like in your life someone some obstacles someone like relentlessly coming after you that you have to overcome any obstacles like that right now um I have had some stuff. It's not that big of a deal. And I might ask you after to take this out. I don't think it's a problem. I need to talk to somebody. Okay. But, uh, and I have a little bit of beef. Yeah. Okay. But uh, like that, like a relentless. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know how much I want to talk about. Okay. Okay. So let's. But I have some. I have some. You have some. Yeah. I mean, uh, ironically, you know, someone who plays is, um, I don't know, maybe edit. 
I don't, right. it's like, I don't let's want to talk let, about Not say his name, but like, uh, in terms of like, how do you deal with an obstacle like that? Um, Matthew Broderick has been a big, um, I guess, mentor. Uh, uh, and they've worked together for a, a long time. Um, he's, uh, uh, it's a silly. I also think about this in other aspects. It's and also like to stay in your lane. And I also learned in therapy, like when you're getting out of a relationship and all these things that you want, like you want them to see you a certain way or or you want them to to uh, uh, to fix something or you, whatever it might be. It's like the only thing you can control is keeping your lane clean and just keeping your side clean. And and, and he's not in control of my lane. <laughs> okay. Um, he bothers, he's talented. He's one of the funniest people in show business, but he's always after... Um, yeah, I just feel a little uncomfortable. Um, yeah. You know this, the saying, Akuna Matata? <laughs> yes. Um, it's the same in Spanish. Um, I came up with that. <laughs> okay. I came up with Akuna Matata. Mm -hmm. And it's not that big of a deal to offer it out. Give me the credit. <laughs> right. <laughs> Timon and Pumba never credited you. Um, it's a Disney thing, and I actually talked about because my show is on ABC. It's Disney, <laughs> right? Um, and I have I'm excited that something is coming out soon. Uh, it involves Larry Charles, uh, Nathan Lane, um, and uh, I think that they're gonna. I'm gonna get a little bit of credit for it. Okay, honestly, yeah, awesome. I can't wait. Okay, last question. Um, what makes Rick Glassman cry, or do you, do you cry? Uh, what is c crying? Why do you cry? <laughs> right. So why why do you cry? I cry all the time. Yeah. Oh yeah. I cry. I cry a lot of times in in sincere moments. A lot of times, if like I'm giving somebody a compliment that like really matters. Uh, by really matters, I mean like there's something I want to like this person affected me, and I want to share this with them. I I tend to cry. I cry. Uh, Brenton and I used to send each other all the time, and we don't anymore because we've probably seen them all. But clips from the talent shows usually it was uh, Britain's Got Talent because they directed a little bit different. Um, although America's Got Talent has been doing it better, <laughs> I'd say maybe for f four years now. Mm -hmm. um, but they were always very much, if it was emotional, it was sap as opposed to really getting in. And it, I think America's Got Talent is actually great at it now. But back in the day when Brent and I were sending stuff, it was usually Britain's Got Talent. But just like moments where you're seeing people like be vulnerable and like get to try their dreams. It's why I love Shark Tank. Uh, I love things like I love a good cry. Okay. Um, I love if if somebody says this movie, you get a good cry in it. I'm in. Do you cry in movies? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah, I feel deeply. Okay. I feel deeply. Feels it feels good to cry, in a different way. Laughing, like feeling things. As long as it's like, you know, I mean, you feel things all the time in life that I'm grateful for that hurt, but like still like, to like a roller coaster where you get to have that feeling of. You're falling, but there's a safety to it. I feel that way with movies too. Like when you get to experience uh, a story that makes you feel a certain thing, but it's not really you. You know, you could get anxious. Like when you're watching right, Precious Gemstones. Um, not Precious Gemstones. Righteous. righteous gem no, not Righteous Gemstones. Righteous Gemstones is, is Divine and Tony. I'm talking yeah. uh, Sandler. What's it called? Um, Uncut Gems. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uncut gems. Mm -hmm. I remember watching that, and, I, and it was just like it affected me chemically in a in a negative way. And I don't know if any movie's ever done that before, but like, I didn't feel that safe. But normally, like, yeah, you get to have a good cry, and but you know, it's just the story. Love it. It's like a roller coaster. Ooh, interesting. Maybe that's why it's a roller coaster of emotions. <laughs> okay. I never thought about it directly analogous like that, but yeah. Okay. What makes you cry? Um, I think I'm I'm pretty emotional too. So um. I cry a lot in movies. In real life, I I, I try to hide it. Um, but yeah, I I, I I don't know. I think I, I I come from a culture that is very macho like, and like like men don't cry. Spanish people are macho. <laughs> Used to be. Not. I'm not saying I I'm not a good represented. Uh, no, I wasn't. I, <laughs> I thought I had a sneak. I agree. <laughs> but I mean, but yeah, Antonio Banderas. Uh, yeah. Right. So yeah. Pet detective. I, 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 I don't I don't think I, I I'm a good uh, specimen but yeah I I think there's a culture that is very much alike and men don't cry so right. I do it I, you know that's not just Spanish that's unfortunately that's we grew up thinking that men are supposed to not cry and women are supposed to cry and I think it's really important that we teach our young boys 
that it's important to show our emotions. So, you know, you get it. Yeah. I don't really care. Yeah, I, 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 can, I can tell. <laughs> okay. No, but we should. We should, absolutely. Okay. We should, Ch we should care. We should be, be more <laughs> vulnerable. Changing gears completely. I want to know how, how well, yeah, how well uh, you know this movie. What movie? So, uh, Terminator 2. They said the same movie, the famous movie that I haven't seen yet. What? I honestly have never seen T2. I know you're lying because I saw your pose last night. I mean, maybe you just saw one 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 part of the movie. You didn't, I, I, I did. We I, we put it on. Like, oh, we're going to talk about this. I should probably see it. Um, <laughs> but I was with uh, Brent and Davy Sullivan, and uh, we weren't. We, we you guys just, were. We didn't get to watch it. Right. Um, okay. So, but I heard about it. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, but I'm not like a trivia. Like, I definitely. I don't know if I'm going to know. Okay. Things, but let's see. Let's uh -oh. see. Oh. Let's see. Here this. we go. First question. <laughs> yep. What do we see in the opening shot of the movie? Oh, iconic. Opening shot is, is what, 2029 or uh, whenever the post-apocalyptic world is. And it's the, the, the Terminator going through with the gun and the lasers and the, the going over all the skulls. And I remember as a kid, I always thought about where are all... To be a skull, it has to have decomposed so much. There has to be... There has been so much time and they all are just there. And if there's that many, there has to, all, that has to keep happening, which means they have to keep happening. So where are the dead bodies? You were doing that as a kid? I remember as a kid thinking <laughs> too many, I don't buy all the skulls. All right. Because I also, as a kid, I was like really obsessed with skulls. I like collected skulls and I saw all these like, it's too clean. I thought it was too clean. Not realistic. Yeah. Enough. But I, yeah, that, 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 that I, I remember, remember very well. And I remember, um, Thinking about uh, uh, the what I guess would now be known as drones, but these things that are robots that are flying. And I remember even thinking, it still looks like a plane. I don't know if it would look like a plane as much, but maybe it's a plane with a computer in it. Mm -hmm. that's cool. In, that's incorrect. That's the opening <laughs> shot, is it not? Freeway traffic in Los Angeles is the opening shot. Oh, I believe that, but that wasn't as iconic. I don't remember it. But yeah, I mean, that, I would argue that Los Angeles is a character in the show. <laughs> Right. To this day, when I see the uh, the the river, the California, the, the LA River, LA River, I always think about it, like I know it because of Terminator. Right. Next but, question. Yeah, the freeway. Then good, you got me. <laughs> it was worth it. What is the date of Judgment Day? Is Judgment Day when uh, Skynet takes over? Yes, and there's the nukes and. Well, I know the year is '97. Yes. Um. It was, uh, it was after the, uh, August, maybe? August is correct. 29th? Yes. For real? <laughs> August 29th. I, I think I guessed that. I know it was 97. <laughs> I think I guessed that. Or that was, that was in there deep somewhere. Yeah. August 29th? Yeah. That's when Skynet, that's when Skynet developed uh, uh, consciousness and decided to nuke Russia. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know why? Why? Because they knew Russia would attack back. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know what? Also, why not just attack yourself and Russia? <laughs> <laughs> anyway next question how many human lives were lost on judgment day three billion correct yeah that be, i was it's uh <laughs> six million jews they, <laughs> they wanted to do less but also they made it billion that's an easy one to remember <laughs> what I, song plays after the t800 gets his clothes from the biker bar oh jethro tull bad to the bone my brother took me to see jethro tull in concert um and because I love Terminator so much, I don't know any other Jethro Tull songs at the time. I think it was George. George Thorogood, not Jethro <laughs> Tull. George Thorogood. I never saw Jethro Tull. He's the flute guy. Um, uh, uh, George Thorogood. That's okay, who I okay. saw in concert. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. How did the T-800 smuggle his shotgun into the shopping mall when he first encountered the T-1000? These aren't hard questions. I've, <laughs> come on, man. I mean, the ro in, a, in a thing of roses. Oh, it's that's like, correct. I kinda, it, when the roses fall and you see him step on the rose. Come on, baby. <laughs> what is the first line the T-800 says to Sarah Connor in Terminator 2? I already said it. You did. Come with me if you want to live. Correct. Good. You're good at this. I didn't think I would know that many <laughs> of these. I thought, I don't know. Keep coming. I'm having fun now, baby. <laughs> this one's a little harder. What does Sarah Connor use to beat up the guard in the mental hospital? Okay, I, I, I let me tell you some things I remember because I don't know the question. I know she has um, some liquid plumber that she's going to put to the syringe to to the main doctor. Uh huh. Um, the guard that licks her face. <laughs> I don't know a nightstick. It, Something that he had that he took that she took from him. It's close. 
Not a nightstick? That's the broom or the mop mm, handle. That's correct. That, yep, that's correct. Mm-hmm. Very good. But yeah. <laughs> what is the name of John Connor's dog? I know this. I've always known this. I'll tell you what it isn't. It's not Wolfie. <laughs> um, oh, wait. What is it? It's Max? <laughs> correct. I remember Wolfie for sure. Um, and also something that bothers me about that, that scene <laughs> is um, he knows that uh, he, he's faking to be his vo- Connor's voice to, to find out if the parents are there, right? So he finds out that that is the T-1000. And then he goes, when are you going to be home? And then he hangs up right away. Now the T-1000 knows that they know. I thought he should have been like, okay, I'll be home in maybe two hours. Um, do you want me to bring you, whatever, to keep him <laughs> waiting, to give him an extra heads up. I'm like, that's nuts to not think that way. But you thought of that in 1991 when you saw it? I, I don't, I, I thought of that. I just remember that <laughs> right, movie. I don't right. imagine I saw it then. Yeah, yeah. That was uh, a very, very screenwriter, a good screenwriter's note. Um, that's a character note more <laughs> yeah. so. But yeah. yeah, I remember thinking like, no, no, it's the same thing when like somebody like <laughs> the they punch somebody and then they, they drop the gun right by him. Take the gun! <laughs> Tie him up! Shoot their knee! <laughs> it was one of those moments. <laughs> you got more? Definitely. Yes, I do. What hand gesture does the T-800 give John before he dies? Come on. I've already done all of these. Yep. All right. Last one. This one's tough. How many Oscars did this movie win? And can you name the categories? No, that's, that's a great question. Oh, I mean, great question. <laughs> um, let me think. It probably won special effects. Yes. Um, uh, makeup? Yes, that's two. Um, at the time, those kind of movies didn't win Best Picture. Um, wouldn't have won... Was you know what? I was James Cameron at least nominated for it. I'm unsure. <laughs> well, then he didn't win. Yeah, no. Um, I mean, I'm only saying this because I love the song. But was it was it score? Was it nominated at least? It it what I I'm unsure. It wasn't it wasn't score, but it was the sound. So yeah, well, sound makes it sound. Usually, things that win best effects, yeah, also win sound design. Right. That's three. Yes. Um, and uh, uh, best supporting actor for <laughs> the guy that goes. Oh, <laughs> 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 uh, was it just a three? <laughs> uh, best sound, best sound effects editing. Yeah. The editing. sound has two, two, two parts, but yeah. Awesome. Okay. Um, one more thing we're going to do. So in this island, I get some of the reviews. That were so. Th- this segment is called "Defend Your Movie." I want to tell you what some critics said about. How long movie. is this going to take? Two minutes. Okay, because I have to pee, and I would pee now and come back. Oh, you can pee now. Let me do that. I've had. All right, thanks. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> did you want to go? I did. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. This is review number one. Okay. What a steaming pile of dog manure. Um, Say that again, but better. <laughs> <laughs> what a steaming pile of dog manure. Are these real reviews? Yeah. Mindless, boring, noisy assault and battery of the senses. Mm. No imagination. Just an endless barrage of action scenes meant to entertain. Just a what? <laughs> <laughs> Mindless. I can go pee. It's going to take Okay. Um, not only does it have the worst acting I've seen in a movie in a long time. The visual effects are so horrible nowadays. How could they win awards for editing? What do you mean nominated when almost every window that gets broken breaks and explodes before anything gets near it? Uh, in this movie, John Connor is a brat to beat all brats, even for a kid. You just hope uh, he gets killed at the end of the movie. Well, first, um, you know, okay. I disagree. Okay. Not that big of a deal. Um, but if you want me to contradict some of your points, uh, yeah. let me first acknowledge, you know, when you go on a date and you date a hundred people and never works out at a certain point, like yeah, I know you were dating a lot of people, funny stuff. <laughs> uh, like Carrie Bradshaw would say at a certain point, you have to look at yourself and realize, am I the problem? Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, 
it's nominated and wins and you're like how could it like if it wasn't even like you could be like how could people like this if that many people like just at least consider maybe you're missing something um i don't know what windows raped and killed your parents <laughs> but it's an action movie and this is how things go you hope john connor dies at the end then you must have been rooting for the t-1000 how interesting that you're that invested that you even love the villain so i think that's odd now let me say this to you if you don't even know the word barrage you obviously use a thesaurus you're looking for help for you to even write your dribble of manure <laughs> How about you appreciate it's hard to write stuff, let alone execute it as well as this movie did. The effects are bad. I don't know how you feel about it now, but that was in 1991. It looked great. I will say when they go back in time and they have the ball that shows up and that wasn't the best. Didn't take me out. But most importantly, you're entitled to your opinion. What, what do you Who do you write for? <laughs> <laughs> Rotten Tomatoes. Mm. You write for them? The, yeah. Well, Rotten Tomatoes is a is a aggregate of, of of all the different yeah. critics. So, what are you a critic? Yeah, this, of? this was like a, a small local paper. Hmm. <laughs> well, congrats, man, and on and, and having your uh, your point of view heard. And um, yeah, I love the movie. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. One more thing I wanted to do. Are you a good T one thousand? Can you do voices like the T one thousand does? Because I want to pull a prank on a friend of ours. Her name is Juicy uh, Johnson. He And I would like for you to be Bobby or Andrew or both and tell her, uh, we're going to call her, see if you can pull off your, your Andrew or Bobby Lee um, voice and uh, see if you can get her to tape herself as Sarah Connor for a sketch that we're going to do for Bad Friends. All right, so y y yes, I will do this. However, I know myself and I know my skill set. <laughs> okay. Not only am I not good at voices, <laughs> okay. I think this will be a big miss. <laughs> and that's not because the situation isn't fun. This is not where I shine. <laughs> okay. Could I do it? Yes. <laughs> would it be better if maybe you did it and I coached you through it? <laughs> maybe. But yeah, I could call, I mean, I could either do a racist Asian impression that I'm not going to be comfortable with, that's not even going to be that funny, or I could pretend to be Bobby Lee and just say random things. Okay. Um, so you were saying you're a bad T-1000. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But I could call, I, could, I have a better chance of calling as Robert Patrick himself. <laughs> And yeah. saying, hey, I'm the guy who was in Terminator. You know, <laughs> the manure barrage of dribble. <laughs> All right. No, so we're going to leave it here. I think we're going to not do this. Because she's going to know. So what would you do? What, what's the plan? Like, you put this on Bad Friends in a way to, like, promote this thing? No, no. This Just a random, unrelated thing? Yeah. Um, I could do, incidentally, a good Sarah Connor. Can you? Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. I love how your mind works. Yeah. Is that it? That's it. Oh, it just ends here? Yeah. Well, you could. You wanna? Yeah. Hey. No, that's fine. <laughs> See you later. Uh, <laughs> what a weird, what a fucking weird ending. <laughs> okay. Let's There's no like, is there anything you want to plug or where can we see you next? I, okay. Hey, Rick. What's is up, there, man? Is there anything you want to plug before I say goodbye? Oh, they know. They can just look me up. It's fine. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much for coming. It was Absolutely. a pleasure to talk to you. Thank talk you for taking you. your shoes off. Okay. I ask you to take your shoes off. You never take your shoes off in your own show. Well, it's in my, it's, this is a sand pit. <laughs> this isn't like a, this is a sand pit. It's, it's clean. Is... Not anymore, but it was clean. <laughs> Are you upset really that I didn't take my shoes off? <laughs> no. Yeah, I thought you were just offering. Right, I was offering. You should have edited this a while ago. <laughs> right. <laughs> it was nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you. Thank you. <laughs>